Hello everyone, and the next lecture is devoted to magnetostrictive materials. Uh, what means the magnetostrictions is a property of magnetic materials that causes them to change their shape or dimension during the process of magnetization. So it means that if you have such piece of magnetic material, you create, uh, have solenoid around, you send current through solenoid, you apply a magnetic field, you can magnetize it in one direction, or you switch field, uh, current polarity, you can switch magnetization in opposite direction. Or you can switch it off and it probably will split into domains at some point. And uh, when all this happens, the size of this magnetic rod changes. And uh, this is not a strong effect, but principally it's also pronounced and we meet it everywhere. I maybe can say a joke, it's a joke. Uh, not from student times, it's from times when I was in school and teacher of physics said it to me, I, I, I remember I was laughing. Uh, so this, <laughs> the teacher of physics is asking the pupil, could you please tell me how a transformer works? You know, transformer with two coils, uh, which we use in our everyday life for our 220 watt, uh, volt sockets. And the answer from the uh, pupil was that it works like this. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> yeah, this is the truth because uh, if you will come close to this transformator, as, uh, which are, for example, in the street where you have a distribution of this voltage, you can hear this noise. And the reason for this is magnetostriction because uh, you have we have current with 50 uh, hertz and when the transformer works, you always apply this alternative current to kind of change magnetization. And this creates, due to magnetostriction, it changes slightly sizes of your element and it creates this noise in 50 gears range, which we hear such a, as a low noise. And um, this is magnetostriction, yes. So, uh, of course, uh, it costs energy, therefore, they spent a lot of efforts to find materials without magnetostriction and permalloy will discuss it. It's a really such a alloy of nickel and iron, which uh, has kind of ideally zero magnetostriction. And uh, how do we describe magnetostriction? So we will just very briefly, we will not go in depth. Uh, so first of all, there, they introduced such a parameter lambda s, which is a change in the lens per unit lens. So it's, if you have such a lens L, and then you magnetize it. Of course, it will depend how you magnetize it. Therefore, they are speaking about saturation. That means that you apply large enough field to saturate fully your magnetic material into the same direction. And then the delta L to L, it's a, a saturation magnetostriction. And this one is quite small. It's only 10 to the power minus 5 or minus 8. Nevertheless, it plays a role in our life. And there is inverse effect, sometimes called the Swiller effect. When you uh, apply stress to your uh, magnetic material, you can change magnetization orientation. And uh, so you kind of influence magnetic uh, properties by applying physical mechanical stress. And um, to explain magnetostriction, maybe really it's easier to start with the inverted effect. Because so we uh, successfully ignored uh, all different types of anisotropy in this course, because I tried to put in that what I believe is important for understanding why magnetic materials are magnetic and so on. A lot of, so it's not a full course of magnetism. Uh, and, um, uh, but there is such a phenomena as crystallographic anisotropy. It means that if you take a, a sphere, I probably already mentioned in the process of this um, uh, lecture. So it's comfortable to think about it in terms of a sphere made of magnetic materials. Because besides as uh, crystallographic anisotropy, which comes from the crystallographic structure, there is also shape anisotropy. For example, if you take a thin film magnetization, most of the materials prefers to stay along the, this, chair, uh, this uh, film in order to minimize influence of so-called uh, imaginary magnetic poles at the edge. So this is usually hard axis, so it means magnetization doesn't want to stay like this, but it wants to be in place. 
and therefore shapanisotropy is very strong in many cases. But uh, if you take sphere, then shape anisotropy is always the same. And in this case, you can uh, pronouncely see the situation is that um, if you take a sphere, it's growing, for example, cubic, and there are this axis 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on. And magnetization from all these possible states will choose one easy axis. So there will be one direction where the total energy of the system will be small. And this direction with respect to crystallographic axis of the structure. So it's quite complex to describe and so on, but uh, just uh, keep in mind that there is some crystallographic direction. And uh, uh, the reason why there is crystallographic anisotropy is why crystallographic structure of our material is coupled to magnetism, because magnetism, as we discussed in most of the cases, comes from a spin of electron. And spin is rotating and principally doesn't care about your um, crystallographic structure at all. Therefore, you need some physical mechanism to couple this magnetism, which is related to spin of electron, to orbit. Because orbit, when you will rotate it and so on, it already fills the orbits of neighboring atoms. Therefore, crystallography is coupled directly to orbit of your electron, how it rotates. Yeah, so in some cases you minimize energy, in some cases you maximize energy. But magnetism is coming from electron itself, and therefore behind each crystallographic anisotropy stands so-called spin-orbit interaction. We will consider it when we will discuss in, uh, spintronics uh, over the next lecture. But the main message at the moment is that we need spin-orbit interaction in order to be able to couple magnetism given by spin of electron to orbit, because orbit already is sensitive to crystallography. To. Good. So this is the first uh, statement. Second statement, imagine that you have magnetic material and suppressed it. Applied very huge current that you change um, pressure, that you change very slightly as uh, the uh, size is less constant. Usually, of course, it's, it's very hard to do it. And we're speaking about uh, 10 to the minus huge values. Uh, the change in this uh, distance, nevertheless, uh, there is a change. And uh, these orbits are very sensitive. For example, you had two orbits and now you overlap. Them. Or you slightly decrease distance and then column interaction is strong. Therefore, this phenomenon is strong and it couples us that if you have material, you press, you change lattice constant, it means, means you change crystallographic structure of your materials. And due to spin orbit interaction, you change so you change crystallographic anisotropy, and anisotropy due to spin-orbit interaction changes magnetization. So this is such complex, complex uh, uh, chain of thoughts. Uh, but to put it all, all together, when you change the lattice constant, then you somehow will have a response on the magnetization produced by the electron. So this is uh, was a finger explanation for Villary effect, and now the same. Having this, we just explained magnetostrictive effects. So we know already that magnetization is a domain when we have material in a domain state, and we will have all these domains pointing in different directions. They will have some size. And the point is that when this magnetization is oriented, here already crystallographic anisotropy plays a role. So this. Uh, um, This magnetization will choose such a direction that also a crystallography of the uh, of your so let's say a minimum of crystallographic energy also will be taken into account in the formation of the domain. Now, when we apply external field, we will have, as we discussed, each of this domain will start to rotate more and more in the direction of applied field. And that which have already good orientation of field will grow, that which um, have opposite will be small. So such a complex mechanism that from this state we will come to this state. And uh, so uh, since we have mm, mm, already the domain here was deformed with respect to crystallographic axis, now when you turn already all domains, they are magnetized in the same direction, but you do not turn a crystallographic axis. It was you know, the same single ma crystal mag material, so it's not polycrystal, it's single crystal. It means that when you turn here the uh, domains, 
you change the size of each domain because now your magnetization is oriented differently with respect to crystallographic axis. And in this case, since you change each domain, at the uh, end of a day, you will get the change of the total size of the magnetic material. Okay, and now uh, how uh, this uh, change in size will be. So as you can see here, the saturation magnetostriction parameter can be positive expansion, negative construction, or in the case of this permalloy nickel iron, 80 to 20 percent, approximately it's zero, so especially people researching. So this material, it's not coupled to a single crystal material. So you see if you have here such uh, uh, axis orientation, because again, it's uh, if it's single crystal it, and split it in domain, it depends if you magnetize it along one zero zero axis or along one 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 axis, you will have different parameters. And you see that the same material iron BCC, you have positive or negative magnetostriction depending how you magnetize your a uh, piece of um, iron. The same for cobalt, for nickel, it's different. So it's all rather complex here. Here's panel, here's the yttrium iron garnet, which we discussed. It has also magnetostriction, but very small. But what's important is that it works not only for single crystals, but also for polycrystals, which consist of many different grains pointed in different directions. Still, you have magnetostriction with negative, positive size. And it works for amorphous materials. And last message is that if you want to use it for your application, there are special materials uh, like this one uh, with a huge value of magnetostriction. And in this video, there will be, it's about application because this magnetostricted materials can be used also for, uh, for, excite, uh, for making ultrasonic sources. So we use ultrasonic, for example, my brush tools use ultrasonic. There are cleaning bases, so in clean room people use ultrasonic to clean things. I think wash machines are already, some of them use ultrasonic. So principally, it's used in many applications. Um, and uh, yeah, this video is a bit about how magnetostricture materials can be used for creation of ultrasound and compared with piezoelectric. So piezoelectric, it's not magnetic, it's another way to create. And I think it's a nice uh, input inside of the pure application. I like Only the style. Only two types of ultrasonic <laughs> transducers have yeah, ever been used to generate the sound waves required for cavitation, piezoelectric and magnetostrictive. Both work effectively. However, each has pros and cons. As a result, Designers over the years have debated which type is preferable for use in an ultrasonic cleaner. We're going to look at how each type of ultrasonic transducer works, the pros and cons of each type, and then let you decide which type best suits your needs. Hi, I'm Frank Pettiflu with Omega Sonics. Let's talk about what these long transducer names really mean. The two types of transducers work in completely different ways to achieve the same result. In piezoelectric transducers, a crystal with special electrical properties called lead zirconate titanate is connected with electrical wires attached to opposite faces of the crystal. The crystal and wires are housed between two metal plates. When voltage is passed through the crystal, it changes the shape. When electricity is taken away, it returns to its original shape. And when there's no voltage at a given frequency, the crystal and the metal housing around it will resonate. Magnetostrictive transducers work on the principle that iron-rich metals expand and contract when they are placed in a magnetic field. To make magnetostrictive transducers, many thin plates of this material are stacked up side by side to make a core. Copper wire is then wrapped cylindrically around the core and the whole assembly is placed in a canister with the top and the bottom of the plates of the canister touching the ends of the core. Since electricity produces a magnetic field, as soon as the current is applied to the copper coil, the core grows in length. When the current is turned off, the core returns to its original shape. This expansion and contraction causes the canister in which it is housed to resonate. There are pros and cons to each type of transducer. Piezoelectric transducers are attached to an ultrasonic cleaner housing using an adhesive, while magnetostrictive transducers are attached by welding the housing to the tank. 
Early on, magnetostrictive transducers had an advantage in this area because adhesives available were not very strong and piezoelectric transducers would detach easily. Today, however, with the advent of modern engineered adhesives developed for the aircraft industry, the difference is negligible. For most parts and contaminants, ultrasonic cleaning is best done between 40 and 70 kilohertz, although some ultrasonic cleaners use frequencies as low as 25 kilohertz and as high as 170 kilohertz or higher. The highest reasonable frequency achievable in a magnetostrictive transducer is around 30 kilohertz because in order to change the resonant frequency, the core must be made shorter and shorter and the system eventually reaches such a low mass that no transmittal of vibration occurs in the tank. Piezoelectric transducers are not limited by this restriction and can therefore accommodate the entire frequency range. So here just a uh, small comments. Of course, he's talking about real application about uh, some devices. In the lab, uh, people are working with magnetostrictive uh, resonators at gigahertz range, so it's, uh, it's possible. But then, of course, everything should have nano sizes. And if you make nano size resonator, uh, it makes no sense for application, yeah, because it will not create vibrations in water, for example. But because of this, magnetostrictive transducers are usually limited to cleaning applications where the parts are large and the contaminants are difficult to remove, but complete cleaning is not required. An example of this would be a plating line. Piezoelectric transducers convert low voltage electrical energy into mechanical energy in one step, making them very efficient. Magnetostrictive transducers convert electrical energy into magnetic energy and then to mechanical energy. A lot of energy is lost in the form of heat during this process, and as a result, these transducers are less efficient. That means for equal amounts of ultrasonic cleaning, these electric transducers will consume much less power. Since most piezoelectric transducers operate at 40 kHz and above, the first subharmonic frequency is above 20 kHz, which is beyond the range a human can hear. Magnetostrictive transducers operate at 30 kHz or less, which puts the first subharmonic in the audible range for humans, 20 Hz to 20 kHz. The sound is identical to the hum emitted by a high-tension electrical line or transformer. When multiple magnetostrictive transducers are mounted in the same ultrasonic cleaning tank, the noise level is such that... When piezoelectric transducers were first designed using quartz crystals, their strength would drop off over a period of time. Magnetostrictive transducers had no such issues, and as a result were the transducer of choice for a long time in ultrasonic cleaning systems. Later, as engineers began to develop the semiconductor ceramic materials used in piezoelectric transducers, they learned that aging the material before converting it to piezoelectric wafers eliminated 99% of the strength degradation. Because of this practice, piezoelectric transducers do not lose effectiveness with age as quickly as they once did. Thus, magnetostrictive transducers lost their biggest advantage. To learn more about ultrasonic transducers, visit omegasonics.com or call 1-800-669-8226. I hope you enjoyed and now we are ready to switch to magnetic liquids, so-called ferrofluids.